Those who use AI to make their practices work better will beat out those who do not use AI. That's a quote I'm hearing more and more. But use AI in revenue cycle management? Are you kidding? Well, no. The answer is yes. And according to my guest today, he'll help us figure out where you might be able to get started. I'm Carl White, principal at Mark Advisory Group, which is a healthcare marketing agency, and I'm also the host of Practice Care. The mission for both is the same, and that's to help private practice owners stay private. Not only is that what they want, but care is better when the provider owns the practice and has the most freedom to make the clinical decisions they think is best for their patients. Unlike when somebody else owns the practice, usually, eventually, the agenda of the owner starts to creep into the provider's ear. And sometimes that can make the provider, compel the provider to make some choices they may not want to make. Care is never compromised, but let's face it, if the provider doesn't have to deal with that, things are just better. My guest today is Jeff Hilliam. Jeff is the CEO of Red House Medical Billing, a full-service revenue cycle management company with offices nationwide. Jeff's work in healthcare focuses on revenue cycle strategy and management, contract negotiation, and tech implementation. He aims to keep private groups competitive in a heavily consolidated healthcare environment. And not so recently, Jeff has begun taking interest in how AI can integrate into revenue cycle management. And he's very excited by the opportunities that he sees, and he's going to share some of his thinking today. Jeff. Thanks for coming on. Love having uh, love having me on the show, Dan. Yeah, really appreciate it. I've been looking forward to this one for a while. You cannot breathe, look around to your left or right without seeing AI, somebody who is excited about it, somebody who's annoyed or frightened by it, most people who don't understand it. So hopefully through this foggy mess, we can bring some clarity today uh, in this particular part of the AI world. So yes, I've been digging this one for a while. Excellent. Um, so your bio is necessarily brief. I've said this on every episode. This is where I like to start. Help us get to know you a bit better, um, more than your bio can say. I'm curious how you got into revenue cycle management of all things. Um, no judgments, but why that as opposed to anything else, how AI kind of got in there. So help us out. Yeah, absolutely. Well, again, thanks for having me. I first, listen, I first started my company doing just some standard consulting work, financial modeling, some stuff like that a couple of years out of my MBA. And I was working with healthcare clients mm -hmm. at some point in the process of sales and referral making and all this stuff. Somebody asked a younger version of me, Hey, can you do our billing? And, uh, as a very naive, ambitious entrepreneur, I was like, heck yeah, I'll do your you billing. Made a mistake of saying yes. <laughs> yeah, you got and here it. Here we are today. <laughs> and here, and here we are. Now the one interesting thing about that though, uh, uh, what I found quickly is, you know, it's actually a very stable business. And, and from True. an entrepreneur's point of view, you sit there and look at that, you know, recurring monthly revenue and you say, boy, that feels a lot safer than, uh, you know, how many consulting projects can I scrape together? And so after uh, sort of deciding how I was going to move forward, I ended up buying a small uh, RCM company in mm -hmm. Phoenix. And that was, that was the genesis of this whole thing. And since then, uh, we have, we've bought some, we've merged with some, we've organically grown, but we've got offices in Phoenix, St. Louis, Detroit, Boston, Manila, and Chennai. And sort of the rest is history. And the rest is history and you're writing history. Cool. So, um, so let's, let's just jump right in. And I'm curious to start, um, what are some of the areas in, in Red House where you're using AI? It doesn't have to be an exhaustive list, but some of something, you know, some areas that'll help us kind of wrap our head around it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, like a lot of people were doing this with sales emails and stuff like that. But when it comes specifically, let's talk operationally in the RCM world, right? So mm -hmm. we have pushed really hard with our uh, with our vendors to try to get them to pay any attention to us, right? This is the first. This is the first thing. All of the automation, all this fun stuff that goes on in AI is so focused on the doctors. And, and maybe, maybe that's right. Maybe it should be, right? All mm -hmm. the interoperability and all the, you know, pulling it together. It's all patient focused, diagnosis, AI, and all this stuff, leaving the revenue cycle a little bit behind. And certainly the technology in RCM lags behind its EMR counterparts. So where we have pushed is to try to find people who have found ways to increase automation attached to EMRs. So when you are coming through, and I'll walk you through an ideal scenario yeah. right now. So if you're a practice owner or facility and you have a great EMR system in place, 
your doctors know how to code and code properly. That's a big one, right? But as long as they code <laughs> properly, they, they close that chart, we can run it through an automatic scrubber, which will hopefully stop it from getting that rejection, which delays the whole process. Mm -hmm. From there, it can transmit automatically. Now, let's say everybody behaves nicely and the insurance company pays us. Uh, we already have a bot that can sit there and break down the EOB and do the, you know, the payment, the adjustment, and reallocate to patient responsibility. From there, we have a interface auto automated already that will, you know, anytime the EOB says, hey, there's patient responsibility within 24 hours, it'll sit there and initiate a patient cycle where the patient gets both digital and paper. If the patient pays, it automatically records that both in the in the payment inter, you know in the payment uh, patient payment interface, but also in the PM system. Okay. So you think about that, and you you just saw that currently already in 2023, this isn't some futuristic talk. Already, if a doctor closes their note clean mm -hmm. and everybody pays, nobody touched it. Yeah, so I was going to ask you compared to what. So you mean compared to what it used to be even recently? Yeah, just so, to have the frame of reference. Yeah, well, so look, I'll even say that the majority of our clients don't have that kind of clean cycle, right? You've got to mm -hmm. have, you've got to, everybody's got to be on the EMR and the PM and, and as a mid-size multi-specialty billing company, you don't always get that synergy and it's difficult to talk doctors into using a more sophisticated software if they're the owners and they pay for it. Yeah. Sometimes that's a tough sell most billing cycles and let's oh boy let's just let's just say they're using the EMR because boy there's a lot of people that are still fighting that push which you know anybody no. listening but I encourage you to make that switch it'll Please. make your life better it'll pay for itself okay uh, but if they're using the EMR hopefully someone's got a bridge and it's pulling in and automatically because if you do have to enter it of course anytime you introduce a human process you introduce human error mm -hmm. so Assuming that that's not the case, it comes in, the scrubbing is probably done, you know, with a, with a spot check, and then they submit. Mostly, I think people are still posting by hand, or they're doing an auto post with ERAs hooked up. Uh, they don't have the bot, though, that does it while we sleep, right? They still have to go in and do it yeah. uh, manually. The patient stuff, again, I do know a lot of people have moved to digital, but there are still a lot of people manually sending out paper, and that's it. And a lot of people are still manually posting uh, patient payments. The hardest ones, of course, are the in-office patient payments. Those are the ones that almost all billing companies are missing in the automation cycle. But there's five or six touch points where people are touching these, these claims, even yeah. in digital billing. So the automation, when you stick it at each point of contact, both reduces the potential for human error increases the velocity of capital and increases the data integrity. So there's a, there's a lot of benefit to moving forward into the AI world. Yeah. I was just, it's, it's going to go faster because it, it could be done at two in the morning, whatever, whenever it happens to come in. And there's five fewer chances of somebody making a mistake. Yeah. And so for those of you listening, think about the last time you got a <laughs> denial or whatever, and then you went, traced it back. I mean, it wasn't because the, the choice of care was inappropriate. It was because somebody made a clerical or an administrative error. Yeah. And probably, those touch probably, points, right? Yeah. Well, those touch points I just mentioned too, that was when things are clean. If you get denials, all of a sudden you're touching again, right? So all of a sudden yeah. now you got people on telephones and on website portals and all sorts of problems. So when when garbage goes in the system, uh, more chaos breaks loose, right? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> chaos ensues. Yes. Very polite chaos. Cool. So that makes sense. So that's kind of a basic frame of reference. So um, you wrote an article called The Adaptation Imperative, Considering Artificial Intelligence in the in the RCM Industry. Um, and if we can get a link to it, I'd like to get it from you so that we can put it in the show notes for your episode. Um, and I want to go to a couple of parts of it. It's not a long read at all. It's very, I found it very interesting. I think it's got a lot of big ideas, or at least thinking about some of the bigger ideas, What's what to think about next. One of the parts that you talk about early on is you you talk about something called predictive remedies. And my interpretation of it is it's almost like a bit going either beyond automation or maybe more than automation. And, and you say the next movement will be seized by those who understand how to leverage the large data sets we work with to create predictive remedies, 
coding that learns from the historical data set to preempt and fix future workflows. Um, break that down for us, maybe translate it <laughs> a bit because I think I have some idea of what's going on. I mean, the idea of being able to predict anything accurately is massively interesting, but expand yeah, so on that. Tell us what you mean by that. Absolutely. So let me give one step back, right? So the majority of the conversations happening right now in, let, and let's just say the small and mid-sized billing companies, right? Mm -hmm. Groups that are not massively publicly held or owned by large private equity that have internal tech capabilities. You know, we're talking billing RCM straight companies run by entrepreneurs or, you mm -hmm. know, let's say anything under, I don't know, 50 million, right? Okay. So most of the conversation right now is about how to automate, which is mm -hmm. fine. I would say that except for denials and rejection work though, Red House can already automate the entire process with clean data. So automation for us, you know, we got denials automation we want to work on and that's kind of the golden goose of automation, mm -hmm. but it's not what's next. It's what's now. So mm -hmm. what's next is trying to figure out again, like I said, how to use our data sets. I am not a I would, I'm not a large medical billing company. I'm a mid-size RCM company, but even still I'm processing hundreds of millions of dollars of claims, okay. you know, just over the course of time here. And that's a big data set. And the mm. information contained in that is totally statistically significant. Okay. And so I can sit there, let, let me give like a quick example, right? Yeah. So if we're thinking about how can I use this data set to predictively create a remedy, right? With the idea that we're sitting here saying, if garbage goes in, garbage comes out. So what we want to do is we don't want to put garbage in. We don't want to have to automate the fixes. We want to just cut it off. Mm -hmm. So let's say there's a doctor who has been coding the same thing the same way for a couple of years and it consistently gets denied. Well, there should be the opportunity for some coding to be placed to say, here is a history of denials. And let's even just say it, it follows it on a rolling six months. Okay. If the doctor goes in and tries to close a chart that has in the past six months been denied in some sort of trending way, mm -hmm. we should be able to pop something up that says, you know, you know, Have a dear look. provider, don't yeah. close this chart. You're asking for a denial. Right. And from there, we see, you know, we can even have something predicted because if, if it's looking at the denial trends, it also knows in the claims history what fixed the denial. So we ought to be able to predict something and say, hey, every time you've closed a chart like this, it gets denied. Every time it gets fixed, it's either this solution or this solution. Would you like to pick one of those? And the doctor can just click, click, close the chart, be done. And then, you know, and then it automatically goes out and the automation takes over. But that ability to use the data set at a billing company to predict errors before they occur. Mm -hmm. And those types of things happen really well in the eligibility world too. We should be able to know without having to manually or on the phone go through these systems to know if a patient is eligible. We should be able to have the patient's data set, to have the patient filling information out long before there's ever anything happening. We should be able to do these, uh, these checks so that we never have uncollectible patient balances and not only that, but that can help providers' offices give better care. Not maybe, you know, as it were, bedside care, right? But mm -hmm. uh, front desk care, right? That financial relationship that the doctor has with their patients to say, hey, right. listen, if, if, if I see you today, it's going to end up being all on you. So why don't we push this off a week or two if it's not an emergency and let's fix your insurance together. And so there's the opportunity to use these data sets and these tools to stop us from creating problems, which would ultimately create a better financial experience, both for the patient, which again is super important if you're a practice because boy, Google reviews are how you uh, how you get picked, right? More so if of those, yes. patient's <laughs> happy, that's great. Yeah. So I don't know, good for them, good for the doctors. It's uh, it's a win-win if, if we're able to leverage leverage the power of the data. Yeah, and boy, it opens my eyes. I mean, you know, the, the biggest thing I think with AI now, one of the biggest things is the, the only limits to what it might be able to do for you is your own imagination on what you might try to ask it to do for you and then figure out how to prompt it or teach it or structure it in a way that it can give you back what it is that you are looking for. Um, I hadn't thought about that. I, family member, I want to know what's, what's X procedure going to cost? 
And what the insurance company had to do was run what they called a dummy claim. Like, we have no idea. We actually have to run this as if it's already been done. And then we can see. So I waited on the phone for like a half an hour. And I thought, you know, it just, come on. It, <laughs> it's just, it just, it just, re it just reminds me how, I don't know, murky or untransparent what something's going to cost is in healthcare. I hadn't even thought of, of that example. Um, yeah. And actually, that that's actually, uh, I mean, it's, I know maybe that wasn't one of your questions, but it's certainly no, but yeah. one of the, one of the great ways that practices can differentiate because, you know, doctors don't know how much they're going to get paid either, because just because they have a contract with Blue Cross doesn't mean, you know, patient one and patient two have the same kind of coverage. And so uh, it is really complicated to set you know, standard operating procedures in place at your front desk because the number of permutations that a patient could walk in with, mm -hmm. it's kind of staggering. So yeah. being able to automate this would, would be a huge step forward. Yeah, you know, so so it's a really good point. If, if you're thinking, I mean, one of the, you know, where might I start with all this? It's a question I'm going to ask you in, in a little bit. And maybe on the patient facing is not a bad place to start. I mean, another client, uh, we're able to listen to their phone calls. Um, sec question number two, what insurance do you have? I have X. Um, okay. I need all the information. I need the number. I need everything. And give me the phone number if I don't have it. Cause I have to call them and make sure you have benefits that your benefits apply and we'll call you back. And that just makes me cringe. Cause maybe they don't, or maybe the patient went somewhere else and like, man, if you could just make that a bit faster, um, or streamlined or whatever, everybody wins. Um, you, there's another quote, a lot of good quotes in this article, but another one that I want to ask you about kind of relates, I think, to what I said in the beginning, but but let's bring it back up. And you say, ultimately, what is meant to happen is to repurpose our people to foster relationships while the bots plug and chug in the background. And man, it's just it's just a pretty deep statement. I mean, um, let humans interact with humans. And you could just, you could pull that thread and, because we have a lot of humans doing things where they never see other humans. So do you need as many? Do you expand on that statement that you wrote? Wherever yeah, you want to so go. <laughs> yeah, look, I think there's a, a lot of that. And if I were to start maybe high level and narrow it in, you know, I I uh, I have a lot of friends who are artists and, you know, the conversation about AI art is really big. Oh, yeah. And, and I've seen a lot of people just say, you know, this is crazy. We should be having uh, AI wash our dishes, not write the music and, and paint the paintings, right? Mm -hmm. Like we should be having them do the grunt work and letting human beings sort of enjoy the like expressive and creative side rather than outsourcing our creativity. And, you know, that's one, you know, one of those yeah. arguments that's out there. And uh, in some ways, the, the medical billing uh, world can, can see the same thing. You know, if you try to look at what can be outsourced. There's a temptation to try to outsource the communications with your doctors, to make your doctors go through prompts and go through mm -hmm. automated whatever. But in the end, who wants that? Nobody mm -hmm. likes that. Nobody likes call trees. Nobody likes like impersonal stuff. I mean, it's nice to be able to buy a book on Amazon. If you're a patient, it's nice to be able to pay your bill as easily as buying a book on Amazon. Mm -hmm. But it's certainly not nice to, you know, have your doctor say they're busy and send you an automated uh, thing mm -hmm. that says we're going to reschedule and hey, pick your thing and there's no personal interaction. Nobody wants to feel like a statistic at their doctor's office. And so yeah. we have to reject the temptation to use our RPA implementation to replace human interaction. I think for two reasons, even if you don't necessarily believe in that kind of structure, it is simply a good business choice, mm -hmm. especially for a, a practice, someone who mm -hmm. really relies on relationship, uh, you know, yeah. based work to keep your practice alive. But rather than do that, we want to keep those human interactions and take all the push work mm -hmm. off people, right? So that, you know, do I have as big a charge entry team as I used to? I don't. Do I have as big a posting team as I used to? Absolutely not. I mean, I think at some point, even this year, we had so few posters, we had to dissolve the team and find something else for them to do because so much of it was automated. Wow. But we didn't have to get rid of anybody there was more work to do. Mm -hmm. And so as we find ways to use people to interact, we have found that it's not that we, you know, automate and lay off. It's that we're automating and 
you know, we don't have as big a need to hire as we grow basically. Yeah. The automation helps us grow and we're able to, to, you know, repurpose people and create new career paths and whatever. Yeah. But we have found that our attrition rate decreases, the number of patients that are uh, upset decreases that, you know, we just keep the personal touch going and we let the robots do whatever. If I were to say something sort of like, you know, just, you know, people talked about outsourcing for a long time and how much they didn't like it and people still don't like outsourcing. And this isn't going to be the same, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know I, I have staff in the Philippines and I remember one of them telling me once that they were up late at night because they wanted to call someone uh, on an AR call and it needed to be on the US hours. And when they picked up, the person at the insurance company was also in the Philippines. So, <laughs> it, it, you know, it's 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 not going to be like that. It's not going to be where we're outsourcing and it's going to like, you know, demolish labor industries. This is going to be a process of taking people and putting them in touch with clients and having more, you know, client facing time and yeah. even having people going from like, you know, mindless data entry into problem solvers. And that's mm -hmm. where the, like the collaborative training bots working with your team to try to go between different accounts and saying, Hey, if an urgent care does this, can a pediatrician's office have the same rule? And can we train the bot differently to, so the hope is that the AI can get rid of the stuff that nobody likes and we can sort of use the technology to, you know, amplify, you know, company cultures, practice cultures, because, you know, whatever people may, yeah. may love their coworkers, but, uh, that kind of thing can really foster a good working environment as well as, you know, a healthy transition into the use of technology. Right. Because it's freeing up the time to do so, right. It's taking, yeah. So, I mean, if you, if you, you know, why do we outsource things overseas or why do we, because it's, it, it's, I mean, to diminish it, it's kind of like incremental thinking. We have a certain way of doing things. We need to keep those certain ways of doing things and make them ever more efficient. And eventually what that means is that, you're going to have to offshore it, or this is where tech or automation comes in. What you're saying is something different, which is just rethink the whole thing and maybe slice it by where people need to talk to people or could have people talking to people and all the, I'm staring at my computer screen stuff, so to speak. Um, let's get into the hands of, of bots and AI and such, because they can do it a lot better and you can keep things here and have people talking to people. And yeah, you don't necessarily, you can slow the growth of headcount, which, you know, any employee should like to hear because it's job security and, a, and any employer is going to like, because you get to slow the growth of headcount. <laughs> and so yeah, it's, right. you know, it, it just, if you think about it that way, but it, it just means that you have to stare at what you're doing today and go, well, what if we just totally reorganize the thing rather than take process number seven and make it 5% more efficient? You know, like you can do that. We could have done that five years ago. So Yeah. I, I yeah, really like absolutely. it. Yeah. So what's got, what are you looking at in, in terms of AI tools and tech, you know, right now for Red House? What, what's got you excited? What areas, absolutely. what is it? So, yeah. So I've already talked about like the stuff we have going, right? Yeah. The automation we've already got. So for us, now let's talk automation, right? I'll get away from that that predictive remedy. Yeah. But so the, to me, the golden goose of automation is always going to be denials. You know, you think about it, what are the 11,000, you know, uh, codes multiplied by the, the number yeah. of thousands of denial. I mean, you start to look at the number of denial reasons, you know, or oh, I said I wouldn't mention it, but or, you know, the insurance companies are automating denials that might not even be legitimate. Yeah. And it's just, you know, a denial that needs to be resubmitted. You know, why are we going to pay somebody to do that? Uh the denials work is it, you know, we're working uh, right now on a lot of different parts of it. You know, one of them, for example, is, uh, you know, when people show up and say, here's my insurance and it's wrong. Right. So when we're, or let's mm -hmm. say the coordination of benefits, right. We get those denials a lot from, from some, you know, specific group types. And, you know, we look at that and it's really easy and the work is repetitive mm -hmm. and a bot can do it. And yeah. it's great. Right. And it, it also it alleviates not only the revenue cycle, but it also alleviates some of the error rates at front desks, which, mm -hmm. again, for practices overseeing, you know, training and supervision of the front desk can sometimes be really challenging. So anything that can help fix those denials uh, that eliminate moments of human error that can't be avoided uh, to us, that's a big deal, you know, uh, and that's. Yeah. 
it's going to be really hard, though. It's going to be really hard. There aren't a lot of people approaching it because it's a daunting task because of, you know, the million different denials you could get. Right. And so what we find is we see people out there, and I, I mean, every week someone's calling me saying, hey, we have a new tool for this denial, right? We can fix this thing. At some point, these will start, you know, coming together, amalgamating. Yeah. You know, you'll get companies out there that have solutions for big ranges of bots. Or you'll have somebody that says, hey, I can do all the denials for mental health or, or to, or the right. cardio or something. Yeah. So, so, so people will start specializing, but right now it's pretty nascent and yeah. that kind of automation is really exciting because denials, you need problem solvers, but routine denials should be automated. Uh, and, and that's coming. And then as it goes, the labor force, both at a practice and an RCM company, the labor force will change, right? You'll go from having data entry people and whatever to having people who are only solving the problems and that's you know that's gonna be really interesting too uh, mm-hmm. i know that wasn't directly related to your to your convert you know to your to your question but i think that what's important to remember is that as you implement the automation the stuff that's coming down the road you've got to remember the kind of training that you give to your team and you know the mm-hmm. members of your your staff it's gonna be different training mm-hmm. because it, it's just you know it's it's a it's a different job you know their job is going to be solving these problems and training this bot when regulations change the bot needs to be updated someone's going to be watching that so for somebody to implement it if you're a practice not using a billing company who at your company is going to be ready for that challenge three years from now? And are you getting ready to prepare them? Because if you're not preparing now, you won't yeah. be able to be ready to implement uh, on the cutting edge in three years. Yeah. And one of your competitors is going to do it and they're going to approach a practice and say, you know, we have a, a point of difference that's really compelling and it's this. I don't know. We turn around your denials 15 days faster than today and get them approved and behind the scenes is the machine that's AI powered, probably, in order to do that. And there, there it is, right? Um, I'm in this group. Uh, it's sort of this cross-functional healthcare consulting group. And one day, somebody put it in the listserv. I just used ChatGPT to write a denial letter re- response, and and she said it was pretty good. And shocked by that, and just to watch you know, the, the, the multitude of replies of every emotional reaction you could think of, you know, and I was just watching this going, wow, it's, I never really realized any of this before, but uh, shock and awe to fear, to anger, to no way, to holy cow, to how do I do it? It was everything in about an hour <laughs> um, across the country. And so one little thing. Yeah, no, I think that's that's really interesting. Sometimes, you know, I look at this and we as as RCM people, we're sitting here saying, how do we fix this? How do we do that? But at the same time, we're sitting there like that move right there, that 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 chat GPT inclusion. What's really interesting about that is that in a lot of ways we sit here and we try to think, uh, if what's our next move and how's the insurance company going to respond to it? Yeah. Uh, and so you know, we're sitting there and, and I don't know how it went for them, but it could, it, who knows, it could be right that in, in the past, it took a long time to generate that kind of stuff. And the insurance company, uh, their financial model was based around the fact that it took you a long time to get around to that. Mm-hmm. So if we start automating that kind of stuff as an industry, how is the insurance company? Because, you know, they may or may not say they're fighting against us, but boy, Regardless of what they say, we certainly feel that they're fighting against us. It's certainly not yeah. a let's team this up to, you know, where yeah. financial interests are right at the heart of their work, as you know, as, as is natural. And it would be interesting, actually, to see how that chat GPT sort of plays out in this chess match uh, between, you know, how the doctors are going to get paid and how the insurance companies are going to sort of classify and administer denials. Yeah, um, you would think. I, I get it. The longer they hold on to the money, they invest it, they play the float and they, they, they make their money. Um, but there is a certain amount of cost to denying and deal with the denials. And you'd like to think at some point, maybe there's a, the two lines crossed and it just makes more sense for, I don't know, certain claims or whatever. So let's just pay the damn thing, you know, yeah. and just move on with our lives because they're going to call and now our customer support team's going to do, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't want to get, I, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I, I'm not hopeful at all, but. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I don't want to get conspiratorial, but my feeling generally, uh, again, what do I know? I'm not sitting in those meetings, yeah. but it has always felt like there is a modicum of expectation that there is a, a predictable percentage of denials that will never be followed up on. Therefore, yeah. 
they will always keep doing it because it's in their best interest. So you sit here and you look at automation and you say, if we automate every single denial so that everything gets returned, how are they going to respond to that? Because their financial model, their profitability, I don't want to say it relies on it, but their profit is really impacted by the denials that never get followed up on. So that would that would really change the balance of power unless they do something to counteract it. Yeah. That's like a half a penny from the Superman Richard Pryor movie. Remember that? It was the half <laughs> the half a penny nobody ever counted. And, and he would make like a million dollars a day because nobody ever it was a rounding error that he collected. And right. So you, you wonder, like, uh, it's got to be small denials. People say, oh, it's not worth it. But if there's tens of thousands of them every week or whatever, boy, they start to add up to real money. Absolutely. What if, what if they were appealed instead? Um, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think I think the chat GPT thing is uh, super clever. I'd be interested to see if any of the EMR systems, any of the PM systems end up integrating it. And, you know, you could based on the, you know, based on the denial you get back, you could just say, okay, here's the data, automate the thing, send it out. A person might not even need to do it. You know, the, the EOB itself could be its own prompt. Yeah. And, and maybe they could be, it could be connected or have a plugin or whatever that uh, says plug in, go collect the data for chat GPT to fire off that denial letter. That's awfully human sounding and quite compelling. So yeah. <laughs> fight back. Yeah, fight right. Power. <laughs> fight back. Um, <laughs> cool. Well, I said this to a lot of guests. We could go on for a long, long time. Uh, and this is no different, but in the interest of a more kind of bite sized manageable podcast episode length, two questions I ask every guest before we kind of wrap up. First one is in the context specifically, what we've been talking about, anything you think I should have asked you that listeners should know about, but I just didn't ask you. You know, we didn't talk about ROI. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I mentioned earlier that there are new companies reaching out to me every week. And there are like, honestly, people come with the weirdest AI ideas. They're like, look what I can do. And I was like, why would you do that? Like, that doesn't <laughs> make sense, right? Uh, but, you know, we have a bot right now that's being implemented. It's on like 20 accounts right now as a beta test. And we have somebody whose job is basically going to be, here's how much they want to charge us for this. Here's how much time it's saving us. And what's the impact on the company workflow if we do it? And mm. part of what's really difficult, you know, when we go out and try to sell our services, we, you know, we we do differentiate ourselves. You know, we're all about company culture, uh, technology, and payer patient relationships. So technology is, you know, we sort of always promise our customers, you know, we're not developers, but we sit on the consumer side cutting edge. So we are constantly talking to developers and constantly beta testing. Uh, and working, working to improve what we've got going, you know, on behalf of the practices we have, mm -hmm. but it's a little tough. There's two ways that people look at this. They say, oh, geez, if my billing company is doing all this work, it must be getting cheaper for them. So it should be cheaper for me. And that doesn't quite pan yeah. out because the implementation is really complicated. And then on the other side, you get people who think the opposite. You think, oh man, these people are so far ahead of where my practice is. This is going to cost way more than I'm interested in. So there is definitely a developing conversation uh, among doctors, especially doctors that are a little bit younger. And, you know, I think people who've been in practice for 20, 30 years have a, have a rhythm, right? And they're mm -hmm. sometimes less interested, but people who are in this, you know, on, on the early adopters yeah. phase of, of product development, um, there's definitely a complication in ROI. Uh you mean difficult? These, it's not such a clear line, you mean? It's definitely not. And and it's going to be very interesting to see how the, the big software systems uh, play it out because they're not all free. I have a software that wants to charge me to access my own data, uh, which is essentially to me as a, as a small, mid-sized business, it's a tax on innovation. Yeah. And so we are disincentivized from working with that. So as a practice, as a billing company, you got to sit there and say, which pieces of this process can I automate on the software that I'm on? And who are the people who plug in? And what is this software's commitment to technology? Because if they don't have a good platform for it, they're just going to get cannibalized in the development of AI. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a big risk because if you put all your data in one system, migration is costly. So you've mm -hmm. really got to be thinking hard about what is going to pay off and what isn't, you know, one AR bot isn't going to do it, but auto posting your entire posting department away probably was worth it. You know, mm -hmm. so it's, it's a complicated thing for a practice to decide and for a billing company to, to work into their models. Yeah. And so, um, 
you can't really sell it as a, an advantage per se. Um, it's what you do with it. What kind of incremental value can you create? And when you say ROI, do you mean ROI to the to like you, the billing company, or are the ROI you can in turn offer to your clients or both? I, yeah, I think both. And if there's practices big enough, then they're doing their own AI, you know, on their own systems also. Um, we definitely can sell it. I think there's stuff, you know, when we talk about human error, right? The decrease of human yeah. error, the increase of capital. You know, if you've got a 50 day average days in AR, can automation pull that down to 35 days? And if that's the case, boy, that two big weeks deal. of improvement. Yeah, you know, yeah. you look at capital expenditures and all that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's complicated. To, to do it because you can't go from software to software, take a call with an AI company and be like, well, what about this? Or what about that? You know, they may not all be ready to plug into every software. So it mm. can be complicated to calculate the best way to invest in the AI based on how fragmented it is right yeah. now. So anyway, the challenge to come. Bit, bit of the wild west out there right now, which makes total sense. Where do you go to like keep up with? So, you know, there's so much going on. So people, I, I can solve this one billing issue. I can solve these 25,000. How do you keep up? Like you just, are you just like that much of a tech junkie and you just poke around or are there sources online there or anywhere that you go to like clearing houses of they vet it, they take a look at it, they offer their opinion. You know, uh, a lot of what I do, a lot of good networking at organizations like, like AMBA or the HBMA or state okay. by state billing associations. Uh, also, I think I have the benefit of having salespeople approaching me constantly. Oh yeah. Uh, also, you know, groups, you know, there's big groups like Becker's or Fierce Healthcare groups like this that have these newsletters that are coming out. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I do, you know, I am reading these newsletters. I'm, you know, following the, the trending hashtags, watching it on LinkedIn, seeing this stuff. Uh, I don't know the the software companies are always hosting webinars. So anytime, you know, it, it's difficult to distinguish between who's doing, you know, automation and who has like a cheap plugin. And so, you know, you just start, I don't know, like anything, I guess you just start reading. And as you start reading, you start finding the good sources to yeah. read. Okay. And in a lot of ways, the tools and where to find the information will be based on your specialty and your software. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Um, and the other question I ask every guest is, all right, somebody's listening who, who they want to get started on bringing AI in whether they're, you know, a revenue cycle management company, let's say, or maybe even not, it's it's daunting, right? It's large, this topic. Any simple places they could start, it could be anything anywhere. Um, maybe it's, you know, subscribe to Becker's or I don't know, anything just to sort of get them off the starting line, you know, a yeah. little nudge. Let me, let me give the big obvious one. If you're using paper charts, move to an EMR. That's, number one. That's okay. number one. If, <laughs> if you're on a system already, what I would say is a lot of the PM systems, a lot of the you know EMR PM systems, they're developing their own little app stores, as it were, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the first place to start is whichever software where you are working heaviest as a billing company or whichever software you're on, if you're a practice, reach out to your rep and ask them who is developing tools in the system because mm. sometimes they're not advertised. Uh, sometimes there's an app, like, like all scripts has a big list of tools you can have, uh, but uh, other softwares, maybe I shouldn't have called one out, but uh, in other no, softwares- No, but just to, to explain the point, sure. Yeah, and in other softwares you go and you can go to your rep and say, hey, is anybody auto posting this? Is there an eligibility tool I can plug in? Is there a company that's doing patient payments? And you can go to your rep and they go, oh yeah, sure. We got, we got half a dozen people that are, you know, automatically plugged in. I'll hook you up to their sales rep. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I would start with is look at your software and see who is building tools to plug into your software now. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the fastest way to start. And then from there you have that, you know, beta testing and ROI discussions internally and, mm -hmm. and you know, hit, hit the, hit the trail. Makes sense. Start with software, start with tools you're already familiar with. You're right. It's, it's the same thing in my world. Uh, and and there, uh, of the sort of the tools that I use, some are good about announcing new features and benefits and others are not. So sometimes you have to go digging a little bit. That makes a lot of sense. Jeff, awesome. This, this is such a cool topic. I'm glad we got to do this. Um, hopefully we've caught people's attention and maybe I don't know, either got them excited or calmed them down, whichever, so that they can, they can look at it a bit more with, uh, you know, fresh eyes, rational eyes, uh, and, and see a good place to start. So Jeff Hilliam with Red House Medical Billing, got all your thanks again for coming on. Um, 
Got all your, you. Yeah, I got all your contact info that you provided. We're going to put it in the show notes for your episode. Anybody who wants to contact Jeff, that is the fastest way to find him through practice care. A couple of other points before we finish up. First, if you're someone like Jeff or I that tries to uh, serve private practice owners, or if you're a private practice owner yourself, either way, if you've got some business experience on the business side of private practice that you think other private practice owners would benefit from, we want you to come on Practice Care and tell us about it and tell them about it. In the uh, show notes for Jeff's episode and every episode, there's a link, couple of questions, tell us what's on your mind so that we can get you scheduled as soon as possible. And finally, if you haven't done so yet, subscribe to Practice Care. We're on Apple, we're on Spotify, we're on just about every major platform, we're on YouTube. Very easy to find, new episode every week. Subscribe so that you can stay up to date on new episodes. Thanks very much and until next time.